During the 1960s, with the creation of ballistic missile submarines, suddenly both the US and the Soviet Union could hide their primary nuclear strike missiles in a moving launch silo in the vastness of the ocean. This is a huge issue to national security. The thought of a Soviet sub, only hundreds of miles off the US coast, launching a ballistic missile loaded with nukes that would impact the city in only a minute or two, was pretty terrifying. The Soviet subs must be located and tracked. There was one way, however, to locate the subs without actually looking for them. Find out what their orders were. The problem with this, though, was that many Soviet naval bases only used landlines to send their orders, including deep sea cables. One upside was that Soviet transmissions over sea cables was usually unencrypted. To perform this task, very familiar and proven names would come up, such as the Electric Boat Company, the largest and most experienced submarine builder in the world. The man who created the project and helped design the NR-1 was Admiral Rickover, the father of the nuclear navy. He was the man almost solely responsible for the USS Nautilus, the world's first nuclear-powered sub. The NR-1 would be one of the most difficult submarine projects ever built. Everything about its mission and requirements was a problem. Its size would be small, only 130 feet long, less than half as long as a typical nuclear-powered submarine. It would only displace around 400 tons. The average nuclear sub at that time displaced over 5,000 tons. The equipment that the sub would need would all have to be outfitted into this small vessel, along with a nuclear reactor. The sub was constructed inside of the covered dry dock shed at the electric boat shipyard. This was the same dry dock that the USS Nautilus was constructed in. Admiral Rickover was extremely hard to please and wanted everything as simple and reliable as possible. Many of the components used on the sub were first submerged using a research sub, the Trieste, to take these components down thousands of feet to test their functions at depth. The hull of the vessel was built using HY-80 steel, a special alloy of steel specifically made for submarines. The pressure hull of the NR-1 was actually the most perfect round pressure hull a Lidger boat had ever produced to that point. At 12.5 feet in diameter, it was only allowed to be out of round by 1 16th of an inch. The nuclear reactor unit for the submarine had to be specifically designed for the NR-1. A conventional nuclear submarine reactor was massive in comparison. General Electric was tasked with the construction of the reactor unit. It was about the size of a household refrigerator and only had one very small control panel which was manned by one crew member. It produced only 130 horsepower and the top speed for the sub when submerged was only 5 knots. Traditional nuclear subs have lots of lead shielding to reduce radiation exposure to the crew. The NR-1 did not have enough space for this, so a single wall of lead was built between the crew compartment and the reactor housing instead. The rest of the sub was left unshielded. On January 25, 1969, the vessel was launched, far over budget and behind schedule. By mid-August of that year, the sub had completed all of its sea trials and would be assigned to the naval submarine base, New London, Connecticut. The NR-1 was the smallest nuclear-powered sub ever put into service. The sub was equipped with various thrusters which pointed in many directions. They would be used to steer the vessel when submerged, giving it incredible maneuverability. The sub could perform a 180-degree turn within its own length. On the bottom of the sub, it had hydraulically retractable wheels, much like the landing gear on an aircraft. The sub could rest on the bottom of the ocean and even drive along if desired but the wheels were mainly used to provide stability while the sub worked. It was such a small sub that the currents would push the vessel around quite easily, so the wheels were needed. Outside of the sub, it had a large basket used to collect items from the bottom during recovery operations. It also had two differently hydraulically operated manipulator arms used to perform undersea duties. The sub also had many different portholes located in various locations along the hull allowing the crew to observe outside of the sub while on missions. One of the portholes was located on the bottom of the sub, which allowed a crew member to lay on his face against the hole, observing the bottom as the sub creeped along. Various types of sonar were installed in the NR-1. This was so the sub could creep in canyons in tight spots while avoiding collisions while navigating the bottom. The standard crew was 10 men. There were no bathing facilities or kitchen. Instead, the crew would use buckets of water to bathe in, and they would microwave frozen foods to eat. To regenerate oxygen, chlorate candles were burned to remove carbon dioxide, a catalytic converter system was used. The sub was never designed to operate autonomously. 
It was designed to work with a mothership, which would tow the sub to remote locations before releasing it to perform its mission. The Carolyn Quest was the NR-1's primary mothership for most of its service life. The sub could not replenish its own compressed air system used to purge the ballast tanks to surface. Its mothership would perform this duty once the sub had surfaced. The sub did, however, carry 11 tons of lead shot, which could be dumped in case of an emergency in order to surface quickly. Most of the NR-1's missions were highly classified and only spread on a need-to-know basis. They were often performed under the umbrella of deep sea research. Throughout the 70s and the 80s, the NR-1 performed various missions including tapping cables, recovering objects from the seafloor, and was even involved in a joint operation to install undersea antennas on top of sea mounts near the Azores. One incident in 1976 was well publicized. It involved recovering an AIM-54A Phoenix missile from an F-14 Tomcat that was lost at sea. The mission was a success. The NR-1 was likely also used to place and maintain undersea sensors used for the SOSIS program, which was an ocean-wide sound surveillance system used to track Soviet submarines. Many of the SOSIS listening devices were installed in undersea canyons located along the edge of the continental shelf. When positioned correctly, the canyon would function as a natural satellite dish, collecting noise and focusing it down to its bottom, where a sensitive listening device would be waiting. Many of the unclassified missions the NR-1 performed were exploring, quote-unquote, these canyons along the eastern seaboard. They were likely joint missions. In 1986, after the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion, the NR-1 was brought in to aid in the recovery of debris scattered across the seabed. The NR-1 was finally retired in 2009, after 39 years of service. It was the longest-serving active submarine in U.S. history. A small effort was organized to help save the sub and turn it into a museum ship, but this ultimately did not succeed. The sub was sent to Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in Kittery, Maine to be defueled before it would be towed to Puget Sound Naval Shipyard where it was scrapped. Pieces of the NR-1 were preserved and sent back to Groton, Connecticut, where they are currently on display near the USS Nautilus. No, nope, that's the NR1, guys. I appreciate all your views. Um, thank you for supporting my channel. Thank you for all the subscribers I've been gaining lately. Um, like, comment, subscribe. Share any stories that you have that are related to whatever video I just made. And uh, stay safe out there. Thanks.